Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Critical Talk. We've been absent just for a moment, but as you can see and read, we just had to come back. We are a production of Muslim Network News and Sound Vision, and we're just so enthused at being able to get back to talk about some critical issues. Um, this evening, and we're starting just a hot minute late, one of our guests um, had to rescind her acceptance of family issues, but we have a person who stepped up to the plate. So in the meanwhile, let me get started here. We have first on up is Professor Scott Hibbert, who is a regular on Critical Talk, is our political analyst. And he's still teaching courses on American foreign policy, Middle East politics, and international relations. But I want to highlight, you know, I mean, the fact that he's been at DePaul and all of that is good. But I think for our talk tonight, it is about American foreign policy in a way when we're going to talk about media and Middle East politics in a way because we're going to talk about media and international relations. Thank you, Professor Hibbert. Nice to see you again, Anna. Mohammed Ramadan has the honor or detriment, depends on how you look at it, being a lawyer in Chicago and he's founder of Attorneys of Chicago, an award-winning law firm, which I'm going to join shortly as somebody who can run the copy machine, from focusing solely, well, he does, he focuses solely on auto accidents, medical negligence, nursing home abuse, and dog bite case. That is very interesting. Um, <laughs> I'm still a dog bite. Okay, Mohammed Ramadan is from the south side of Chicago. Professor Hibbert is not from Chicago, but he's been there just long enough to have some claims. Um, and both of them, as we will go along, you will hear what's going on. Imam Frederick Aldine is a veteran imam and a chaplain having served cities and federal correction institutions in Oklahoma and Illinois, and a certified marriage counselor. Uh, let me um, get him to meet himself. Okay. Out of the many things that we could talk about this evening, I thought that one of the things that was very important is media and education. Uh, because we have some challenges, but we've all we've had these challenges for a while. So I thought this would be an opportunity to inform and educate about the challenges that we've had for a while. Uh, it was brought to my attention some time ago that Small town newspapers were really the heartthrob of American print media. And that's where a lot of investigative reporting went on. Because we didn't pay much attention, those small newspapers, I don't know if they just lost readership, uh, getting gobbled up by larger conglomerates to the point where it's a few people that own a lot of stuff, print and broadcast media. And they all seem to meet in some room and decide what's news and what's not. I know that all three of you read widely. So your news sources, some of which we're going to list for people listening to this program today are larger than the average American. We, you know, typical Americans, we get wedded 
to one source. So let me start with um, Professor Hibbert and ask, well, what happened to news? I mean, news is always, I mean, the media has always been a source for education. It's been a source even for evidence in law cases, you know? I mean, it's been all over the place. What happened? Uh, well, I guess there's probably two kind of key trends. One is uh, the evolution of the internet and the other is cable television. Uh, with the internet, um, the ability <laughs> of local newspapers to, um, to generate revenue through classified ads greatly diminished. And it sounds kind of odd, but back in the day, you know, the close classified ads paid for a lot of the, you know, the newsroom. And with this, with that loss of revenue, then there were, you know, they basically started to start cutting back on, um, uh, you know, on, on, you know, actual reporting. The, uh, the other side of it is with, you know, the proliferation of the, um, or with the um, uh, cable television, you sort of proliferation of channels and, you know, not everybody watches ABC, CBS, NBC. And there's also, uh, particularly after the Cold War, what was kind of interesting is uh, America's attention kind of shifted. We were less interested in what was happening overseas and all these major news organizations, ABC, NBC, CBS, you know, that had a major presence around the world and, you know, uh, offices in other countries began shutting them down. And, um, and so those are kind of two big trends. Um, I think the other, the third, third trend, if there is one, is just consolidation that you have a lot of corporate media uh, or corporate entities buying up media because it's, you know, it does generate some revenue and, um, and uh, you know, they downsize the, the newsrooms. Uh, and so you, you see a shortage of, um, of local reporting, but they maximize advertising. And that's really what they're, what they're all about. And by the way, the Chicago Trib fell victim to that. But we can talk about that later. Fascinating. Imam hey, Maldin, chime in before I go to the lawyer to set us straight. <laughs> not that I not that I won't try I won't try to set us straight, but just to add a little bit to what the professor indicated, um, another issue is the loss of authority. <laughs> I remember when CBS came on and NBC came on and ABC, their anchors were the sources <laughs> of authority for the rest of us sitting in front of the TV sets around the country. And one of the things that has damaged the impact of the media the, with a clear influence has been the loss of people who consider authority figures in the in the news. Walter Cronkite was Mr. Integrity. And he had the Huntley Brinkley report. And the, those two guys between the two of them, we all felt brought us the news clearly and factually and truthfully also. So once the country started losing its um, respect for our ability to find out who represented the authority in the news or in the media, things started to go downhill from there. And when the three major companies, ABC, NBC, CBS, became outdone by the, the other net, the other networks, cable networks, that kind of sort of sealed the deal and left the, the information seeking public with the need to find out information to make decisions with without any information being there for them to find. Um, attorney Muhammad, even, I mean, lawyers are purveyors of the news. And while you may not be teaching in your daily job, you're teaching, you know, all the time. Because you got to get some evidence for stuff. You know, one of the um, wonderful things when I was at DePaul was I had access to... Uh, what is that thing called? It costs a whole bunch of money. Where I can look up cases, I can follow cases. Lexus Nexus. What, or what Lexus she, uh, Nexus. What she, I miss it so much. Um, but nevertheless, you, like the rest of us, use media Lexus as Lexus. a resource. Lexus Nexus. Yeah, yeah. So how do you, in the in the advent of all of these changes, Get your news. So to answer your original question is going to be my answer for a lot of these questions, which is always follow the money, right? Um, cable news <laughs> has become shock jock news. It is now chasing ratings over chasing truth and veracity of, of this. We've even seen it recently with CNN making claims and then retracting it. The New York Times 
has had to retract because they're so quick to be first to report something and so quick to get the ratings and then Fox News gets rating and then the other side has to kind of compete with that for ratings and then a 24 hour news, they have to fill it in. So when you have that much time, you need to fill it in for revenue reasons. Uh, you're going to get a very uh, a downside in actual reporting like a Walter Cronkite. We are missing a Walter Cronkite of our generation because all the talking heads now are chasing ratings. But to, to answer your direct question, you know, for us as attorneys, um, local news matters a little bit more to us. I mean, national news does matter as well. Uh, mm. But, you know, we have to know what's going on, regardless of what area of law you're practicing, because you need to know what's going on with the world. And we need to know what our clients are going through on a day to day basis. You know, we deal with blue collar people. So when the economy's down, you know, they're more stressed out or they have other issues to deal with. Um, like right now, we're having issues with State Farm and we're realizing through the news that all these wildfires and all these natural disasters have completely demolished their bottom line. So they're taking it out on now our clients for not paying that. So we have to pay attention to the news on that. However, the lobbies of the insurance companies are so strong, they're influencing the media as well. And insurance companies have done a great job of painting us and our clients as the bad people when we're the ones paying the premium. But they're putting these stories out that, you know, um, you know, we're suffering natural disasters. We don't have any money or, I mean, you made 44 billion on just auto claims last year. I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, come on. So I think the elites stay with the elites and the lobbyists push their agendas and all of this is follow the money. Okay. You know, this is to be a conversation, gentlemen. I don't want to call on you one by one. I want a conversation. And my first, uh, thought is what is a lobby an uh, organized interest group that's pushing its agenda for uh, for a particular purpose now what's interesting is like i always talk about lobbies in terms of you know washington dc where i worked for many years and you know everybody has everyone's lobbyists and this is part of the pluralist you know narrative or pluralist understanding of american of american democracy everybody has their interests but um, but you know uh, organized interests also don't just lobby Congress. They also lobby state legislatures. They lobby local um, uh, aldermen and councils members. But they also lobby media, right? Because they were they were trying to spin their narrative, and um, which I think is what um, what you know Muhammad was getting at. Um, yeah, but you're just, saying yeah. they lobby them. They feed them. They take them to dinner. They give them money. They buy but them things well they also you know just if anything else you know they they send talking points and one of the things that i that's really changed a lot in, in washington dc is you'll have um lobby shops actually writing legislation writing speeches um you know drafting things for a congressional office that historically a staff member would do but everyone's so overworked and they you know turn to a lobby organization to you know help the congressman you know produces you know uh you know, his press releases. So the four of us could decide we were going to be a lobby. You need now, money. Now, granted, we don't have any go money. Back to, go back to Muhammad. Follow the money. <laughs> so, sorry. Professor, and, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned lobby, but it's not only the fact that they have that space where the contact and the influencing is done, i.e. the lobby, hotels, and what have you, but it's also what they're doing as a lobbyist. And I think would you agree that what they're actually doing is establishing two things. One, who is the authority that you should listen to? And what's, what's the benefits of doing that? And two, what are you actually seeing that's really the factual as opposed to being unfactual? So lobbies yeah. have a, 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 would you agree that they have a very influential role in, in making the media be effective? Yeah, no, sure, sure. And I, I like your comment about who's the authority, authoritative voice, because that's part of what the lobbyists are, are doing. Um, and you, you look in you know, Washington, um, you know, who, who are you going to turn to to be an, a neutral arbiter in you know, issues like the, you know, the current conflict in the Middle East? Well, there's, there's you know, certain news sources that say one thing, certain news sources that say another. So who, you know, who do you turn to? And, uh, and, the, and the lobbyists have an enormous amount of sway in shaping who is an authoritative figure talking about this, you know, one issue or another. 
Jump in, Muhammad. I see you. <laughs> you know, I, I just think there is no objective media anymore. I think they're chasing their base because their base is what's tuning in. And again, they need the views in order to attract uh, advertisers. And also there's a sense of fear now, right? There's no critical thinking. You're not allowed to question certain things. You're not allowed to question certain, um, you know, whether it's certain governments, certain people, because too many are afraid to be canceled. And the opposite side of that is like a Fox News. They're not scared to say lies because the lies, you know, get their base riled up. And when your base is riled up, guess what? You're going to tell all your friends you watch this on Fox News and then your friends are riled up and then they're going to go to Fox News. And I know I'm picking on Fox News, but they deserve to be picked on because. I, 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 got a job. He does not work for you. <laughs> yeah. no, actually, no, I, I will follow up on that because what, it's kind of an interesting comment. In the aftermath of the 2020 or um, yeah the 2020 election or 2020 yeah 2020 elections, um, uh, Fox News started kind of reporting. They were actually they called the election for Biden, and their viewers revolted, and viewers were leaving Fox for the more extreme ideological networks. So there was a there, there was a sense within the Fox upper echelons that hey we've got to toe the lie in order to retain our base, and so it's it's kind of an interesting twist i mean it's not like the you know air gone by that um you know um the federal federal was uh, noting a minute ago where you know there were these authority figures that were informing and educating now it's really quite the opposite you've got anchors kind of uh, pandering to a um to a base and um so the you know the the, the system's been kind of turned on its head and there's an elephant in a room we haven't discussed yet and the elephant in the room is social media social media is now hold it hold it we're going to take a little break. I want you to get all of your notes together on information, dis and misinformation, and social media. Uh, we're going to take a break. This is Professor Amina Aldean with Critical Talk for Sound Vision TV and Muslim Network.
Good evening, Salaam Alaikum, and hello to those of you who have decided to join us. This is Professor Amina al Dean with Critical Talk on Muslim Network TV, which I hope you tune into because some of these issues um, are un unclogged, un untangled on Muslim Network TV news, which comes on every day. Please watch. This evening, however, we're talking about media and education. And I want to get with my guest, Professor Hibber, Attorney Muhammad Ramadan, and Imam al -Din. The issue, you know, issues around mis and disinformation and social media. I don't know that all of the mis and disinformation can be blamed on social media. I don't know, but it seems to me like a lot of it was there before. I think even some of the people we grew up with, Walter Cronkite, what was that other boy's name? Um, Brinkley. Brinkley. Yeah. yeah. You're dating yourself. I forget, I forget the no, 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 no. I looked it up in the history book. I'm not dating myself. Thank you very much. Google talk. Um, <laughs> but even they weren't. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? We got used to a particular kind of presentation and the fact that sometimes they were overseas, sometimes they were back in the studio, right? And they were the only people you saw. I, uh, you're right, I am dating myself. I was around when 24-hour TV began uh, and the Iran Iranian hostage crisis. And I was in shock. I'm saying, oh, my God, I got to go to bed. I can't keep watching this, right? Um, but then I became a fan of Rachel Maddow. But then that show started sounding like CNN. And then all of the network, I mean, the local network news, I don't know, who shot who, the cat is in the tree. If it bleeds, it bleeds. Never. Of anything about the world. Professor That's Ramadan, you know. Professor, Ramadan, Professor Ramadan had a question. He posed just before the break. As a, yeah, as a, well, let's go. What exactly is social media? Yeah, I, I think social media has revolutionized everything, for better or worse. Um, you know, we could look at Gaza right now. Most of us are getting our news from Instagram, from Facebook, from Twitter, X, whatever they're calling it now, because the trust in traditional media has, com I don't want to say completely deteriorated, but, I mean, the trust is very minimal at this point um, with traditional media. And we've seen what CNN tells us. And then we go with, you know, news reporters who are reporting live through Instagram. And we're seeing a completely different picture. And that furthers the, you know, mistrust in traditional media. But I think if you took a poll right now of Americans, you know, across the country, I would have to say it's got to be an all-time low of what traditional media and the trust level is with people. So social media has kind of leveled the playing field for Voices who have traditionally been left out of the traditional media, for example, the Palestinian voice has, it still has been left out. Um, social media has allowed other platforms and other journalists who might not get the attention, now can get the attention with someone like Mahdez, who has 12 million Instagram followers. I mean, I think CNN would kill for one of their followers, uh, one of their um, top people to have a 12 million person following. And it's unedited, it's raw, it's there, and you can't stop it. It's their platform. And I think that's become and created a counterbalance to the traditional media, which most people just do not trust anymore because they're very disingenuous. And I know you mentioned Rachel Maddow. You know, her and the rest, they have selective um, sympathy and empathy. I mean, if you look at how Rachel Maddow reported the Ukrainian issue versus how she's treating the Palestinian issue, there's an extreme bias there. And I think other media is scared to call each other out, 
But even her, I mean, this, this, this false sense of liberalism and they have selective outrage and social media has given us other avenues to really counter that selective empathy and selective outrage and has given us more. Now, the flip side of that is you're going to get a lot of fake things on there. So there yeah. is, you know, there's always a give and take, but that's everything, right? Everything's a give and take, yeah. even traditional media. I mean, again, yeah. we don't know what they're saying is true. I mean, I look at some of the reporting right now on the whole Gaza issue. I don't think anyone really trusts CNN on what they're reporting. So social media has leveled the playing field for traditional voices who have not had the platform to to uh, raise their concerns and, and question certain facts. Uh, there is a downside to that, but I think the positive far outweighs the negative of social media. Now, it could be a generational thing as well. So I'd like to kind of get it, you know, what yeah. you guys think of that. But my <laughs> generation, mean, we're going to social media for news, whether you guys exactly. like it or not. Yeah, are you saying I'm a different generation, Muhammad? <laughs> hey, I, le I left it out there. <laughs> so, no, but uh, you're raising some really good points. Um, and I, th I think, you know, the, the, what I take away is this uh, social media is really a two edged sword that on the one hand has contributed to kind of a fragmentation of the media market. And it's not just social media, even like the proliferation of all these cable news channels. Um, there's some you probably never heard of like Blaze, which um, was founded, uh, well, anyway, it's, you know, it's a right wing uh, you know, news channel. And, you know, so you have all these, you have this like fragmentation of the media market and we all, and we all kind of inhabit these very different silos. And so we get our information from you know, a handful of sources, and some of them you know, are more, can be more objective than others. Some are going to be more biased, and uh, and some of some of them are you know kind of blatantly propagandistic. Um, and the problem with that is you know for from a political perspective, is now there's no common denominator. You don't have the Huntley Brinkley Report. You don't have the uh, uh, CBS News with Walter Cronkite. You don't have that kind of shared information. Granted, there was more integrity you know to the news gathering. Um, you know, institution back then, but you don't, so you don't have a kind of a, a shared framework for even approaching politics. And it's one of the reasons why American politics is so polarized that the culture has really changed because of this you know, media fragmentation and that's bled into, um, bled into our politics. Uh, now, one last thing, uh, you know, yeah, of course, uh, you know, Mohammed made this, you know, incredible point about where people are getting their information about, you know, the, you know, the situation in Gaza and the, you know, um, the Israeli incursion. And it's, it's, you know, it's really amazing just the, the spread and, um, or the amount of disinformation that's coming out through Twitter and the amount of, you know, the biased reporting or just the, you know, the way in which reporting goes down. I, I was kind of leafing through all these different media um, organizations just to kind of see how people are pitching stories. And, uh, and I was kind of surprised that uh, the way you know, CNN was doing some of its coverage this weekend. And, um, you know, very, you know, very, you know, not necessarily, you know, an unbiased source. And, uh, and of course, then I'm also looking at new, uh, news organizations overseas to get, you know, a, an alternative perspective and particularly a Palestinian perspective. And, um, and I'll tell you, you know, you read any you know, the newspapers in Egypt and they are providing a very different narrative than what you're getting here in the United States. And, and going on that point. Um, back to that. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Imam. You're talking about what we're talking about is the proliferation and distribution of signs. Communication, we're talking about communication, we're talking about the media. One thing that has happened to the media in response, further response to uh, uh, Attorney uh, Ramadan's statement, contribution, is that th there is no normal or correct or right sign, set of signs that say, this is how it is. Walter Cronkite and the other guys back in the day were believed because there was a shared understanding of this is how things work. You committed a crime, you got caught, you were arrested, tried, and you were, you, you, you were adjudicated, it was adjudicated, and you went to jail or you didn't. Now there's no guarantee that people who commit crimes will go to jail. Like the former President Trump says, I can go down the street in New York City and shoot somebody and, and nothing will happen. M mimicking a character from um, a, a, in, in one of Arnold Schwarzenegger's movies. The other thing is, building on that is, we, we don't have we don't have these control of media access. So what media has become it can be subsumed in two words: YouTube. It's all about you, and it comes through that tube, and, and, it, and it, it presents itself as an authoritative source. And until we get a handle, I think until we get a handle on who has access to the to media with integrity. 
we're going to have the continued downsliding of uh, the respect for media and for truth that we see happening in, in front of us every day. But but my my argument to that is traditional media is, you know, Walter Cronkite's are long gone, right? I mean, that was ages ago as far as... Let's watch that ages. Well, don't, don't put too many ages on that. <laughs> Meaning <laughs> traditional media has forced people into YouTube and all that. I mean, I'll give you a perfect example. Mark Lamont Hill on CNN. The moment he had a counter um, argument oh. or something that didn't align with them, and he was providing facts. Mark Lamont Hill was providing <laughs> factual proof, and he was forever banned, and now he had to go to non-traditional media. And you're talking about, in my opinion, a superstar talent and a black man who spoke up against what was not the traditional um, you know, statements made on CNN, he was gone. And people like us see that and we say, hold on, there is no objectivity here. There is no room for diverging views because if they bring two separate views, they bring the polar opposites to make sure they fight each other. They don't bring two different views to have a discussion. They bring two opposite views to make sure that they, they're gonna go ahead and fight each other. So. I understand and I and I kind of agree um, about the social media, but I think traditional media should take a large chunk of that responsibility for having crappy reporting that's not objective and getting rid of any reporter who does not toe the line. And generations now are starting to say, hey, we do not trust you. So we are going to go to these fringe guys on YouTube and Instagram. Um, because we just don't trust traditional media. And I think they need to take a big blame for that. Yeah, no, and I think a lot of that's driven by the corporate ownership of the media. I mean, I, I always joke about this. Uh, you know, people talk about the um, media as being liberal. It's like it's not really liberal; it's corporate. Yeah. And it's at yeah. the end of the day, it's always looking, you know, you know, chasing dollars and advertising revenue. And so, you, if you have controversial positions, you are going to, you know, alienate people. Um, the, the one uh, news program that I watch religiously is uh, the PBS NewsHour, and the reason I like it so much is it's partially government funded, partially just you know donations, so they don't rely on you know ads. But they really do bring in people with diverse perspectives to hash, mm -hmm. you know, hash issues out. And I feel like that, you know, that to me is, and it's not, they're not bringing them in for the fireworks. They're bringing them in to try to get a better understanding of an issue by looking at, you know, competing perspectives. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's what I try to do in my classroom. It's not necessarily what people want to do for entertainment, um, but, it, but, you know, but it's, it's important for, you know, for education. And also, let's discuss the diversity in C-suites and all these major corporations who run these, uh, yeah. you know, media conglomerates. I guarantee if you go look at those C-suites, uh, you're not going to see yeah. different views. You're going to see some of the traditional looks. And that, that's a trickle down effect. So it really starts at the top. And if there's no diversity at top, it, it's not going to trickle down to your anchors, your reporters. Um, I mean, you know. Jonathan Stewart was one of the most critical, and he's a comedian for God's yeah. sake. Yeah. Right. And he jokes about that and says, I'm more credible and I'm on Comedy Central. But just to show you how far off the ledge we've gone to where a John Stewart is to, deemed to be credible, and there were studies showing that people found him more credible than any CNN anchor. That's how far off the ledge we've gone and how far the trust has gone. And I think if you look at the top, and again, follow the money. Um, if you look at the top, there's just not much diversity, and it's trickling down. So, and the other scary, guys, and the other scary what do we do it? with this information? How you know? Because one, uh, when when students want to know, how do I know nowadays what is true? Right? I mean the the uh, the reprints of oh, I misunderstood this, or I shouldn't have said that. Nobody ever reads, right? They read the first thing that was out there. How do we, whether you're talking to clients or in counseling or in the classroom, how do you get, because people are, are messing with the truth to angle themselves. Okay, so this, this is actually- angle themselves in their favor. Yeah, this is an important issue, um, both for education and for media, since I guess is the topic. It's also for politics. But we, we offer a course on um, called Political Inquiry. We require all of our you know, majors to take it these days. 
Uh, I'm not sure we, I don't think we had it when, you know, when Muhammad was in uh, school, but, Thank, but, you know, but the whole point is, yeah, the whole point is like, you know, we, we want to look at, you know, kind of empirical, empirically verifiable reality. You can make claims, but what's the basis of your claims? You know, you can make an argument, but what are, what are the assumptions that are going, they're feeding into that argument? And so what we really try to do is get students to be able to pick apart arguments, look at the assumptions that are being made in arguments and see if those assumptions are empirically verifiable. And if they're not, well, then maybe we need to rethink, you know, we think our assumptions, we think, you know, our arguments. And, um, and there are, you know, and th that's in the, that is important because you are operating within a, you know, within a reality where, you know, there is, you know, where you can, you know, verify facts. In politics, so much of what passes for these days for um, arguments are completely, you know, unverifiable. They're lies. I mean, like, you know, not to, not to diss Donald Trump, but I mean, honestly, like, he, he lied as easily as he breathes. I mean, he's, he's making these statements, stuff right and center, that are empirically unverifiable. And, uh, and that's a real problem for any kind of civil, you know, civil discourse in the society. So, but, I mean, it's a cultural issue. I mean, we're the microwave generation right now, right? Um, you know, everything's yeah. snipped and winding now, like you said, they read the headline, um, they don't want to read it. But, Again, the, the question I would kind of send back is print media was always biased too. Let's just not say the YouTubers are, are, are the only ones who are not factual. Print media, I mean, you know, biases have been around forever, right? Um, yeah. False information uh, has been around forever, but I think it's a cultural thing now of just being very polemic. And I think Scott or someone mentioned it earlier, the difference now is people don't go read the news to create an opinion. They find an op they have their opinion. They go find news <laughs> to justify their opinion. Therefore, they don't look anything outside of their already preconceived opinion. And I think that's a very scary proposition. It is a generational thing, and it is the way our society is kind of heading. And I think that's the scary part that we come with our preconceived notions and look for media to justify it. And if we don't, and if we see something that's opposite, they're bad or that's false or you know whatever it is. And I think that's amazing. But why, 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 Imam, are we doing that? What is the 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 need? Is there a need in the plural place to have a stake? Is what, I mean, what, what is the need that is being served? One answer is the feeding the appetite. If I can the whole, for the appetite for power, if we look at the. Hmm. Professor mentioned the cancellation phenomenon. Um, the, granted, he sounds like he's got a, a good course set up there that he, that he just described to us. But if a couple of students get up and say that something about the way he presents it makes them feel, tr triggers unwanted feelings of um, harm and fear and, and distrust in them, they take him to court. And we know stories of, of professors at the University of Chicago and elsewhere that have been put sent, had a dunce cap put on their head and made to sit in the corner until they, they come back to their senses because they made some students feel threatened. And so if that is something that can happen to um, vested professors, what does that mean with regards to the ability to the average Joe and Jane to make an argument in a public forum, for example, and, and make, make a valid point that could be accepted or rejected rationally by the fellows and and to take that one step further uh the trend in higher education right now is to move away from tenured faculty members where you once you get over a certain hoop you have a, a job basically for life um now it's all contract and um an adjunct or part-time faculty it's Wait very minute. difficult Can you say that again please? yeah so uh so the trend <laughs> is away from tenure line faculty where you have some job stability and the majority of our, the vast majority of the co of course credit hours that are taught in our university and really any university in Chicago are taught by either uh, part-time faculty or we refer to as contract <coughs> faculty, people who have around one, two or three year contracts. And, uh, and those contract people can be dismissed like that. At will. So how do you, you know, have difficult conversations? You know, how do you teach Middle East politics? How do you teach Israeli-Palestinian conflict? I mean, it's going to be whatever you, whatever you know, material you're going to sign, you're going to piss somebody off. 
And if you're, um, you know, if you're a contract faculty member, you're going to really think long and hard about offering those kinds of courses. Um, and that's and that's a real. So what are you going to offer? Mickey Mouse went to <laughs> Disneyland. <laughs> Literature. The other, the other part of this that's scary is what is, what 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 is happening or has happened to the law. I mean, the law for me is consumer wars, parking wars. These programs that come on and show you how humanity falls apart in the courtroom and they start throwing punches at each other and shooting each other in the courtrooms. And then the uh, what, we have these programs like, uh, what is, what's the lady's name? Judge, Judge, Judge Judy. Judy. These people are becoming the face of the law in this country. And um, I, I can't see that having any positive effects. So um, what we have to do, I think, is get back to teaching people to focus on how to distinguish what the signs that we see around us actually mean by, by definitely setting up an example to um, buttress our, our, our claims of what this is reality. Because I have to believe that if people do that, what is real will show itself and that what is a lie dysfunctional can both easily be debunked. I'm going to ask each of you to give my producer one news source that you kind of sort of almost trust. And for those listening, so that we can put that in the, in the basket <laughs> with all of the other sources that we may or may not listen to. And then we're going to take a little quick break, but I want to come back and say, what is all of this? I mean, uh, doing to us as a supposedly literate society. Everything is not liberal or what right wing. You know, it depends on who you're talking to and about what you're talking with them. Um, what What is this going to do to us? How can we have some foresight and strategize to get in front of some of it? We'll be so, right back. This so. is Professor Amina Altine, Critical Talk Network TV, which I hope everybody is watching. We'll be right back.
Assalamu alaikum again. This is Professor Amina Aldine with Critical Talk, which is a production of Sound Vision. But I wanted to also give the audience a little bit of a update. We're talking about media and education, an exceptionally important thing to talk about. This today, 15 years ago, or probably 15 years in the future. Uh, I have asked our panelists, Professor Hibbett, Attorney Ramadan, and Imam al Dean, to share with us just one extra site, show, programs, anything that we can go on. And I'm going to ask all of you to promise me that you'll come back because this is, I mean, I'm listening to, I mean, it's scary that universities, and I don't know that people know this, that universities are doing, uh, that's insidious. Yeah. I get rid of tenure. I hire contract workers. I don't know who they are. <clears throat> I mean, there's some vetting, but not a whole lot that goes on. My kids are getting taught by, you know, <coughs> Will Blow. I don't know which corner he came off of, you know, and they're quiet. So, of course, and critical thinking is is off their radar. So getting back to your original question, so what are some of the news sources? Uh, I already mentioned one earlier. The PBS NewsHour is one of the most objective um, and thoughtful um, uh, pro news programs out there. I actually, I'm also, I read the New York Times and the Washington Post uh, extensively. They have their biases, but the reporting is, is extremely good. And then, of course, you know, it's, it's good to get a diversity of views. And, um, and hence, you know, I, you know, for pretty Mario, good. Make sure you're putting this up on the crawl. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, and anyway, but you know, it's always helpful to get, you know, diversity of views. Um, I actually like to read Al Haram online. This is an English language um, uh, weekly out of um, Egypt. Um, Haaretz in Israel is great. Um, it's very critical. Um, you know, there, there are other news sources. The Guardian uh, newspaper in England is, is really outstanding. So, you know, so you, you can even go to like, you know, think tanks like Middle East Institute if you want to get up to date reporting on, you know, what's going on in the region. You know, Middle East Institute is really good. They've got a, a great, you know, uh, stable of writers. And, um, and so you, you, you can find information, but it's not, you know, but you have to spend a little bit of time looking for it. Yeah, I agree with Scott. I, I still read the New York Times. I still think it's the world's newspaper. Um, I think that that is a starting point. Um, I agree with Harris. I think Harris is more critical of the Israeli government than our own media mm -hmm. in the United States, totally. which totally. is incredible to me. Uh, yeah. They're very critical. Um, I, the one I would add, I am an Amy Goodman fan, uh, Democracy Now. Um, I, I am a fan of hers. I do think that there's some critical thinking. I do think she... Um, she does ask good questions. Um, you know, it's not like traditional media. To some, it's a little boring. I get that. But, I mean, I don't know how you can really spice up some of these topics. I mean, there's just, if you want to have a critical conversation, um, it's not going to be all the bells and whistles. But I, I, I do like Amy Goodman. I know some have their issues with her, but I, I do like Democracy Now. Um, and then from there, it's, you know, hyper niche. I mean, if you want something business, then you can go to certain business publications. If you want, you know, sports, there's certain sports publications. But I still think the New York Times is the world's newspaper. So I do think that that is my starting point. Yeah. If I see some biases, then I might go to Al Jazeera. I might go to Harrods and kind of get a counterbalance and then kind of go in the middle. And if I feel a topic needs more, I can dive into, um, like Scott said, some of the think tank papers which are, you know, more intense. But if you want to really dive in, um, I think that is a route to go. And with Google these days, I think the access to that um, really allows you to get more access to, you know, certain publications that we just couldn't get yeah. pre-internet. If I can make a plug to um, the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding at uh, Georgetown has been doing a series of interviews with just different journalists, academics, you uh, mean people, the bridge interview? What, uh, I mean the bridge Well, it's, so they're, they're affiliated. That's affiliated with the Center for Christian okay. Muslim Understanding. It's a center that was founded by John Esposito, uh, but now there's an individual named Nader Hashimi who's very much involved in them with them, and he's been doing a series of interviews that are just really outstanding. Um, Peter Beinart from the New Republic was on recently. They had um, uh, one of the editors of um, 
uh, kind of was Jadalia, which is a um, uh, kind of research organization that gives a kind of a, more of an Arab perspective. Really outstanding. And, um, you know, again, it's they're doing it they're, and it's all the stuff is available online and they're doing this public programming, which is a real contribution, particularly in a moment like, you know, that's going on right now where there is so much disinformation about what's actually transpiring, you know, between Israel and Hamas and what are the implications? Um, yeah. You know, and so anyway, so you, you can find this, you know, this material okay. out there. Okay. Imam Aldi, you want to add to our list? Well, um, I'd like to have, give you a surprise. Bill Maher, real time? Yeah. He's recently <laughs> my, developed, my cousin he's, loves he's him. Recently developed a brain that's interesting to listen to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the foreign affairs. And um, I listen to, I listen to Fox News, watch Fox News balance that off with the CNN. And then and an important thing that I try to do, I'm not very successful at it, is to talk to people I know or that someone that I know knows in the area where a, a, an issue of concern is has been raised. I try to talk to them one-on-one -on -one, uh, by telephone. So let me, as we close out, let me ask Professor Hibbert to give us a homework assignment. <laughs> Play pretend that all of us are in the course on critical thinking. Choose an article, an opinion, and send it to us. Okay. Have us do what critical thinking does with it. Okay. I will, I will send that to you. Um, and then we will meet back here because um, to just give you time to, to get it together, whatever it is you want to send. And I'm going to try to expand the players. Um, say three weeks. Okay. okay. I'm sure there's still going to be a war. Um, yes. <laughs> 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 it's not a war. Let's let's be careful how we phrase this. Okay, okay, okay. It's not a I war. I thank all of you enough for taking this topic seriously. Uh, it's really, really appreciated, uh, especially in this time. It's been a topic forever and will probably continue to be a topic. But I really, really appreciate all of your input. Can I say one thing? Maybe. My You're kids are watching. I just want to say <laughs> hi, Lily. Hi, Layla. Hi, Malik. They're watching. So <laughs> I have to give them a shout out because if I don't and go home, they're going to yell at me for not saying that. Okay. To my kids. <laughs> Amen. Go ahead. Say the one thing. That was the one thing. <laughs> oh, my God. I don't believe he did that to me. Okay. All, right. All of you, I can't thank you enough. Scott, as usual, you're back on as my political analyst uh, because I, some of the stuff I can't make heads or tails out of, not because I can't tell the truth from a lie, but more so, there's so much stuff going on undercover. Oh, my God. <laughs> so this is Professor Amina Aldine for Critical Talk. I would put on my list Muslim Network News. It's on every day. I encourage all of you to watch it. And even though the news blurbs are short, they will spark your interest to go look up something. Thank all of you again, Professor Hibbert, Attorney Ramadan, Imam al and we will see you shortly. Take care.